Welcome to this presentation on pancreatic anatomy and imaging. This presentation is actually intended for a flipped classroom experience, which means that you should watch these two videos that I've created and posted to YouTube before we actually go through this PowerPoint presentation. The first is a uh, video of anatomy and CT imaging of the pancreas. It's a long one, it's 41 minutes, but we go through pretty much everything that you'll need to know about imaging and the basic anatomy of the pancreas. And we're gonna review all of that here. The second one is ultrasound of the pancreas. It's only seven minutes. Students have a great level of difficulty when we do ultrasound of the pancreas and we'll use some class time and some virtual lab time to go through better the uh, ultrasound of the pancreas since a lot of students seem to think it looks more like clouds. So let's take a look at the learning objectives. First, I want you to be able to visualize the pancreatic anatomy and the relationships of the pancreas to the surrounding viscera. Then we're gonna go back and review some anatomy which we've had before. What is the foramen of Winslow? What's it important for? And then how is the foramen of Winslow related to the Pringle maneuver? What is the Pringle maneuver and how is it used? We also know the foramen of Winslow is also known as the epiploic foramen. So get both of these terms down and how both of them are related to a Pringle maneuver and how a Pringle maneuver can be life-saving. Then, of course, since this is a lecture on anatomy and imaging, I want you to be able to identify on cross-sectional images in writing and verbally the, the pertinent pancreatic anatomy. Uh, even more important, we need you to just understand what the normal anatomy of the pancreas looks like on a CT scan. After we've understood what normal looks like, then we'll go back and look at some common pancreatic pathologies. And I've listed some of those here. For example, you'll recognize what a pseudocyst and a pancreatic abscess is, and then what are Ranson's criteria of acute pancreatitis. You probably won't get this in your only GI course, which is coming up, so I'm gonna give it to you here. You're gonna hear about Ranson's criteria for diagnosing and using those criteria for predicting the outcome of a patient who has acute pancreatitis. What is chronic calcific pancreatitis and what most likely is the cause of it? Show me what a pancreatic head malignancy looks like. Let's talk about uh, varices, not only gastric varices, but esophageal varices. Both of these are a result of portal hypertension and the development of ascites. What happens when a child hits his abdomen on the handlebars of his bicycle and ends up with a traumatic transection. How do we treat it? What's an annular pancreas? To understand this, you'll need to go back and read your Langman's atlas on embryology, but we'll talk about it and I'll show you some images of an annular pancreas. You've heard about SMA syndrome and nutcracker syndrome before. We're going to revisit those and then we're going to look at some retroperitoneal lymphadenopathy. Large lymph nodes encasing the aorta and the retroperitoneum often seen in diseases such as lymphoma. Of course, we're not done yet. I want you to be able to draw the main branches of the celiac axis and not only name them, but what do they go to and what organs do they supply blood for. Draw the relationship of the superior mesenteric artery and the superior mesic vein and how those two vessels are related to the pancreatic anatomy. Then you need to tell me what a portal system is and the relationship of the pancreas with the abdominal portal system. You learned about portal system and what it was in Dr. Robinson's talk on the pituitary uh, and hypothalamic axis, but we will revisit it here because the body's largest portal system is in the abdomen. Then we're gonna talk a little bit about the pancreas and those structures that support its exocrine function, mainly the ductal system of the pancreas. And then back to that kid on the bicycle, what happens if you transect that duct and how do we deal with such an injury? How does the embryological development of the pancreas contribute to the formation of an annular pancreas? Again, you need to go back and read Langman's on this. Again, we're gonna talk about nutcracker syndrome and SMA syndrome. And what is the pathognomonic feature of the splenic artery? Let me answer that for you right now. It's really long and tortuous. And that's how you can recognize the artery from the splenic vein on a CT scan. The vein's pretty straight. The artery is very tortuous like a pig's tail. Then recognize on cross-sectional imaging the common childhood injury that occurs when a kid crashes his bicycle. We've mentioned it three times now, so it must be important. 
What's Gray Turner sign and Collins sign? And how are these related to trauma uh, of the pancreas and how they show up on our physical exams? And then lastly, look at some cross-sectional images of the pancreas, not only in CT, but through VH dissector, some cadaver images by Dr. Ackland, and identify the clinically relevant anatomy. Of course, we can't go through this without talking about what schemes all of this is related to. Of course, the pancreas is pathognomonic for abdominal pain in alcoholics, often a cause of chronic abdominal pain. So the abdominal distension, abdominal mass, and abdominal pain schemes are, are intimately related with the pancreas through acute and chronic pancreatitis, through the celiac plexus involvement, which leads to an almost unbearable pain. This is sometimes treated by an anesthesiologist using a celiac plexus block. Patient can also get an ileus from pancreatitis. An ileus is almost a paralyzation of the nerves to the gut. This is what happens when you get the stomach flu or you eat bad food. Peristalsis doesn't occur anymore and your intestines just lay there like they're paralyzed. That's called an ileus and that can happen from pancreatitis or from surgery. There's lots of things that can cause an ileus. Of course, pancreatic cancer and a pancreatic pseudocyst, and we'll talk about what those are and what causes each of them. Let's look at an abnormal chest x-ray where we can look at an effusion in the left lower lobe, which is secondary to pancreatitis. Patients with acute pancreatitis often present with fluid or pneumonia in that left lower lobe. Do you remember what we call that when a patient gets an effusion secondary to another process? Of course, we've already mentioned this before, but the schemes for abuse and addiction disorders, such as alcoholism, which is a cause of chronic pancreatitis. We'll need to review Ranson's criteria. If you don't know what that is now, you might want to go ahead and Google it and see what you can find. And we're going to talk about how pancreatitis can lead to acute renal failure. Of course, pancreatitis presents with all types of fluid and electrolyte abnormalities, which can lead to sepsis dehydration, fluid sequestration, and even hypoxemia. We just mentioned uh, pneumonia and effusion and how those can lead to a, a cough. So what about heartburn and dyspepsia? Patients often present with epigastric pain and right upper quadrant abdominal pain. This can be a result of pancreatitis or gallstone pancreatitis. What about fever? Of course, pancreatitis or pancreatic abscess or even a pseudocyst can cause a fever. Headaches. Headaches can be caused from just about anything, as you've already learned. But dehydration, pain, electrolyte abnormalities, fluid sequestration, all of these can lead to headaches. Electrolyte and lipid abnormalities. Some people have a chronic hypercholesterolemia or a hypertriglyceridemia. And I'm talking these numbers are in the thousands. This leads people with that disease and that genetic predisposition to having high cholesterol to develop uh, pancreatitis. And of course, if you've already looked up Ranson's criteria, you'll see where hypotension and shock can be a secondary presentation for a patient with acute pancreatitis, a pancreatic abscess, or even pneumonia. And then let's not forget about jaundice, gallstone-induced pancreatitis gallstone pancreatitis right here and jaundice they're related so we'll learn a little bit about those too we're not done yet because there's a ton of schemes that pancreatitis is related to lymphadenopathy chronic acidosis and metabolic alkalosis also a result of pancreatitis nausea and vomiting lymphadenopathy is a result of a uh, neck mass a Verkau's node can be caused, as we've learned previously, uh, in a woman by breast cancer, in a man by lung cancer, but it can also be caused from a gastrointestinal malignancy. If someone has a malignancy of the pancreas, it may show up as a neck mass with left supraclavicular lymphadenopathy. A skin rash. There's a rare tumor called a glucagonoma, which can cause a really weird skin rash. And as you'd guess, a glucagonoma also secretes glucagon. Recurrent or persistent pancreatitis. 
recurrent or persistent infections, back pain as a result of the celiac plexus being involved with the pancreatitis causing an intense, unrelenting back pain, seizures as a result of drinking from fever, electrolyte abnormalities, dehydration, of course trauma, the little kid hitting his belly on the bicycle handlebars, and fluid sequestration can lead to anemia as well as should a pancreatic pseudocyst bleed or should a uh, pancre pancreatic abscess erode into a splenic artery, the patient can bleed to death. Of course, weight loss, weakness, these are just some of the schemes that the pancreas is all intimately related with. So one of the first things we need to do is to visualize the pancreatic anatomy and its relationship to the surrounding viscera. So in this image, we can see the pancreas, which lies in the retroperitoneum. Here's the uncinate process of the pancreas. And we can see how the pancreas is, is divided up into a head of the pancreas, a neck, a body, and a tail. The tail of the pancreas nestles itself right up into the spleen. Right over the most superior aspect of the pancreas, we can see the splenic artery, which is a branch of the celiac artery, the celiac trunk, or the celiac plexus, is, or I'm sorry, the celiac trunk, <clears throat> or the uh, uh, celiac axis. So in this image, not only do we see the pancreas in the retroperitoneum, but the head of the pancreas is intimately associated with the C-loop, i.e. the retroperitoneal portion of the duodenum. The uh, spleen is considered intraperitoneal, we could argue that. Here's the adrenal gland, here's the kidney. Let's uh, take a look and see uh, how else that this is related and the other important anatomy we need to look at. So we've mentioned the duodenum, we've mentioned the pancreas, the splenic artery, the spleen. Of course, we have the uh, inferior vena cava with the hepatic uh, venous drainage from the liver here. Uh, but this is all intimately associated with the pancreas. Any pancreatic trauma here, uh, i.e. hitting someone in the abdomen really hard, can actually push the pancreas against the vertebra and cause it to uh, fracture. We'll see that coming up. So back to a little bit of uh, embryology. We know about the greater and the lesser sac, but let's talk about why they're important. So if we open an abdomen and we're able to grab the stomach and look underneath the stomach, we have entered what's called an area uh, of the lesser sac. And what this is showing us here is how from an embryological standpoint, when the um, spleen formed and the liver formed uh, from the uh, dorsal mesogastrium and the ventral mesogastrium, that it left an empty pocket here. Now this is important because fluid, and here's the pancreas, fluid from pancreatitis can leak into and cause this space to be uh, secondarily uh, filled with pancreatic fluid. Normally it's an empty space, but in order to get to the pancreas so we can actually look at it in the operating room, we need to raise the stomach up, open, the lesser sac and the way that we do this is we open the gastrocolic omentum the gastrocolic ligament and we put our hand right beneath the stomach and into the lesser sac here it is from a lateral viewpoint and <clears throat> looking at this we need to divide the gastrocolic ligament and go right above the transverse colon enter into the lesser sac and here's the pancreas so you have to know your way around this embryological anatomy in order to get access to the pancreas. Today that's important because they're doing pancreas transplants, small bowel transplants, islet cell transplants, doing Whipple procedures for uh, pancreatic carcinoma. We'll talk about a Whipple, Whipple procedure a little later, but this anatomy is incredibly important. And of course the lesser omentum, which is way up top, way up here and we'll take a look at that in one of my surgical videos and I'll show you where that lesser omentum is at. But for now we just need to know that the lesser sac lies anterior to the pancreas right there. So here it is. We've uh, opened up the uh, abdomen, we've removed the stomach and all of this area here is in the lesser sac. So here's the pancreas 
right here. Here's the transverse colon. And the lesser sac would normally be right up here. So we've exposed, or I'm sorry, the lesser omentum. I'm sorry, all of this is lesser sac, but the lesser omentum would be uh, up here. Turns out that <clears throat> there is something that's pretty important that involves the lesser sac. So here, the surgeon has divided the gastrocolic ligament, raised up the stomach, and now we're in the lesser sac. We can also enter the lesser sac uh, a little differently by putting our finger right behind what's called the porta hepatis, right behind where the gallbladder enters the uh, duodenum, and there's a space that allows a surgeon to enter with his finger the uh, lesser sac. If he pinches over the um, hepatoduodenal ligament, which contains the common bile duct, the hepatic artery, and the portal vein, he can stop horrendous bleeding in the event of a trauma, and that's called a Pringle maneuver. So again, the foramen of Winslow, epiploic foramen, refers to this sort of direct anatomical opening into the lesser sac. Now here's something else that happens, and it's rare as rocking horse manure, but you got to know about it. Once in a while, a piece of small intestine can actually get stuck up and migrate its way back into the lesser sac. I've seen one case of that in a patient that I had, uh, and it definitely wasn't what I was thinking when I went in to operate on them, that they had a bowel obstruction as a result of small bowel up into the foramen of Winslow. So weirder things have happened, but it's nice to know this anatomy. Now let's start taking a look at cross-sectional anatomy. This is a beautiful image, and here... We've done a transverse section through the abdomen. Here's the pancreas. This is the area that we're looking at. Here, of course, is the stomach. This right here is the lesser sac, as you can see this. And then the head of the pancreas wraps around the superior mesenteric vein and the superior mesenteric uh, artery. Here we see um, the vertebra. We see the aorta. Here is the inferior vena cava. And just anterior to this, of course, the superior mesenteric artery and vein, the body of the pancreas comes over here. Now, this image does not show us very well the splenic artery or the splenic vein. We'll get to that in just a minute. <clears throat> so let's look at some of this anatomy that we just saw in that CAT scan. So here, spina, the vertebra, and here is the aorta. This is the crura of the diaphragm, right here where I'm uh, putting my uh, cursor. Here is the uh, vena cava. Here's the right kidney, the left kidney, the spleen. And here's the pancreas right here. Sort of fuzzy looking little guy right there. And the reason that the intestines are, are lit up with white is we've used an oral iodine containing contrast. Um, it is not barium. It is called uh, gastrographin. And you'll learn that when you get to uh, your GI course. So here's the pancreas right here. And we don't yet quite get a good view of the superior mesenteric artery and vein. Here's gallbladder, liver. Here's another look. Right here's the pancreas. Here's some small vessels, or they could be lymph nodes. Uh, it's not clear to me because we're not using intravenous contrast. It could be small vessels or lymph nodes. Here again is the spleen. This is probably... Uh, splenic vein. I'm not totally sure. If we look at this other image here, you get an idea that there's a vessel that runs right there where my cursor is at. That's probably the splenic vein. Hard to tell though without IV contrast. Here's another image. Again, we've got the liver, the gallbladder, the right kidney, the left kidney, the aorta, the vena cava, and here's our buddy right here. Here's the pancreas. Right there. Here's the pancreas. This is probably common bile duct right here. Okay, so now let's look at the ultrasound. This one really wraps kids up because when they look at this, they see mostly clouds. So let's label some stuff. Let me show you first where the pancreas is. So this is a normal uh, ultrasound of a human pancreas. So here, kind of bright white lit up because of the fat content is the pancreas right there. So let's label some things so that we know where we're at. Right off the top, we see the vertebral body. What's above the vertebral body? 
That's a no-brainer, the aorta. What's next to the aorta? Well, we know this is going to be vena cava. So here is the superior mesenteric artery and vein, of which we know are intimately associated with the head of the pancreas. IVC, which I've mentioned. Over here is the hepatic portal vein, which comes off the IVC. Here is the uh, splenic vein, which we know because the anatomy of the portal system tells us that the spleen, which is over here, has a large vein which drains into the superior mesenteric vein. Here we see, right here, this is the duct of the pancreas. It's well seen here. This is the main pancreatic duct. Here's the spleen. Here's the liver. And there's the duodenum. So this is the duodenum right here. This is the small uh, intestine. So all we're doing here is we're looking at a cross section of the abdomen, except we're using ultrasound to do it. It's the same image as that one from VH Dissector or the one from the textbook. If you can understand and label this anatomy, and if you can recognize this shiny white area in here as the pancreas with all of these surrounding structures, the spleen, the vertebral body, the aorta, the superior mesenteric artery and vein, the main pancreatic duct, the uh, splenic vein, if you can recognize all of this on this image, you'll do fine in, in looking at other cross sections. So here is the uh, right kidney, and right there I've labeled the pancreas for you. Great big white blob there in the center. So let's look at some pancreatic pathology. So here's the pancreas, full of calcium deposits. This is called chronic calcific pancreatitis, most likely as a result of chronic alcoholism. So we're going to get to where we can recognize all of these different pathologies. So let's take a look and let's go through and uh, see what we can recognize on these uh, cross sections. So let's just get oriented. Of course, we're always looking at a CT scan from the feet up to the head. So there's a no-brainer here. We can see the right kidney. We can see... Not sure if this is spleen, probably is spleen. We see the uh, diaphragm here, the edge of the diaphragm right there. This giant wad of tissue here is a really engorged, irritated, infected pancreas that has air in it. So we know that gas forming organisms uh, have infected this pancreas and now it's going to lead to a pancreatic abscess. What else can we see? Right here's a gallbladder. These are gallstones. I suspect that this patient has pancreatitis. This is acute. Um, uh, uh, this is acute pancreatitis with pancreatic abscess formation, probably because these gallstones are stuck at the confluence of the major pancreatic duct and the common bile duct. And if you remember some of your basic anatomy. Uh, the duct of Worsong and the duct of uh, Santorini uh, will drain into the duodenum. The duct of Worsong commonly joins the common bile duct at the ampulla of water, and that's where these stones are stuck, is at the ampulla of water. And over here we see all this fluid. This is fluid floating above the liver. This is sequestration of fluid. So this patient's going to present with intense abdominal pain, fever, uh, ascites, and uh, probably might even be septic. All of this is inflammatory fluid and uh, sequestrated fluid around this pancreas. So this guy's really sick. So here's a pseudocyst. Patients who often drink and have severe calcific pancreatitis develop these cysts in the uh, body of the pancreas. These cysts are a result of the enzymes of the pancreas literally digesting themselves. They form into a large pancreatic pseudocyst because it does not have an epithelial wall. That's why we call it a pseudocyst instead of a real cyst. A real cyst would have a well-organized epithelial wall. But let's orient ourselves. Right kidney, left kidney, liver, giant pancreatic pseudocyst, aorta. What's this? Superior mesenteric artery, superior mesenteric vein. This little 
bit right there is the splenic vein. Here's the head of the pancreas right here. Head of the pancreas. This is the bile duct. And this is the pissed off pseudocyst right there. Now, how do we drain these? Most of the time, we don't do anything. We wait six weeks for them to organize, to settle down. And if we have to drain them, we would actually poke a hole directly into the posterior wall of the stomach, right into the uh, pancreatic abscess or the, excuse me, the pancreatic pseudocyst and drain it that way. Here, I've already mentioned this chronic calcific pancreatitis, usually a result of uh, alcoholism. Um, and here we see it on a plain film. This is a plain abdominal film. And the arrows show us all the little calcium deposits that we can see here in the uh, pancreas. Let's look at uh, cancer of the pancreas. This actually was one of my patients who presented uh, with uh, abnormal blood test. And uh, they had an elevated uh, bilirubin and an elevated alkaline phosphatase. We'll get more of this in the GI course. But... This patient has a large mass here in the head of the pancreas. So here's the stomach. Here's aorta. Here is, what is this guy's going over to the left kidney. So this is the cava and this is the renal vein. You know this renal vein right here. The left renal vein, aorta, cava. And this is a stent. This is a plastic stent that was put into this patient's common bile duct so that she could uh, drain the enzymes and the bile from her liver because the tumor was blocking up her uh, bile duct. So this is just another view of the same tumor. Same thing, big old plastic stent in the head of the pancreas. <clears throat> kidney, kidney, vertebra, aorta, liver, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, stomach here and a mass in the head of the pancreas. And I, this is air within the duodenum here, but I can't clearly see all of the walls of the duodenum. This is oral contrast flowing down into the duodenum. So this right here is probably the pylorus of the stomach. Pylorus leading down into the C portion of the duodenum, stent in the uh, main uh, bile duct. All right, so let's talk about varices and portal hypertension. In people who drink a lot, they end up getting cirrhosis. And what happens is the liver scars, and scarred liver does not allow for blood to filter through it well. So all of the blood backs up, and it backs up through the portal system. And if you remember, a portal system is a system where blood flows through two capillary beds before it goes back to the heart. So where are the capillary beds here? Well, capillary bed and one is in the liver and the other is the capillary beds that are found in the spleen. So on its way back to the heart, its blood is flowing out of the, out of the spleen, draining through the uh, vein here, the splenic vein, here's the splenic vein, here's the tortuous uh, splenic artery that looks like a little pig's tail on CAT scan. This of course is the celiac axis. This is the left gastric artery. And before we get lost in all this minutia, this uh, blood will flow into the portal vein. So here is portal vein. The portal vein is made up of the superior mesenteric uh, vein, the uh, inferior mesenteric vein, and the splenic vein, where they all join together. It's right here. And this is the hepatic portal vein. Blood backs up all the way up through all these venous channels, back up here, and you eventually get big, giant, dilated veins in the esophagus right here because they flow up here. And you also get veins that are dilated up into the stomach and the liver, or I'm, excuse me, the spleen will get two to three times normal size. It just gets giant. So now let's look at some of this uh, relevant anatomy that you need to know. First of all, the celiac trunk. It's the first branch of the uh, aorta as it comes out from the chest right through the uh, hiatus here. This is the aortic hiatus. Here's the esophageal hiatus. So we have the uh, left gastric artery. We have a splenic artery, a splenic vein. We have an inferior mesenteric vein, superior mesenteric vein, and right next to the superior mesenteric vein is the superior mesenteric artery right here. And look at those boys crossing over that duodenum right there. 
What happens if the superior mesenteric artery pinches off that uh, duodenum? What do we call that? Is that nutcracker syndrome or is that SMA syndrome? Well, it's SMA syndrome when it pinches off the duodenum. It's nutcracker syndrome right here when it pinches off the uh, left renal vein. But that's not the point of this slide. It's to get you thinking about how the uh, venous flow through these two portal, through these two capillary systems gets all backed up in here and what can happen. Here's an example of a, a cirrhotic liver does not allow blood to flow through it well. How blood backs up. Through the portal vein, the splenic vein gets engorged. Uh, we have the uh, gastric vein, which gives us gastric varices and esophageal varices. And here's what esophageal varices look like right here. These big dilated veins in the esophagus, they bleed. Uh, people can bleed to death from them. Uh, and here is the uh, same image after we've put some clips around those bleeding esophageal varices. In time, these will heal over and slough off. The patient will probably uh, bleed again. And of course, under the microscope, as Dr. Fish will tell you, you have tons of, of scarring in the liver. It looks like little miniature uh, bicycle chains. Um, that's the way that uh, I used to remember this in med school. The, the liver under a microscope that's scarred like this has uh, little bicycle chains, and you can see the scarring run, running right through here. This is the uh, fibrous tissue of, of uh, liver scar from the cirrhosis. And of course, this is what a cirrhotic liver looks like. Um, just for fun, let me see if I can click on this and it'll take you out to a video that, of me operating on a patient with severe cirrhosis. Um, and don't get all lost up into this video because that's not the point of this. The idea here is just to show you what a cirrhotic liver looks like. If you want to watch me take out a gallbladder, um, uh, you can watch the whole seven minutes. So <clears throat> let's look at some of this. Let's look at these gastric and esophageal varices in a patient who has cirrhosis. So here's a patient, doesn't show well, who has a cirrhotic liver. They have fluid over the liver. Their belly is floating around in acidic fluid, which is a high protein fluid. And then here we have these little pigtail veins, and these are um, gastric varices. So here's the stomach. And here are these large dilated veins around, right there, large dilated veins uh, around the stomach. Here's a spleen. The spleen is large. It's not huge. It's about twice normal size. Here's a, the splenic veins. Here, again, you can see a mass in the head of the pancreas. Here is the aorta. Directly coming off the aorta is a superior mesenteric artery. Here's a superior mesenteric vein. Something's going on with the head of this uh, pancreas right here. This right here doesn't look normal to me at all. This is just air in the colon. This is the colon here. This is the large intestine up here. And of course, the kidneys you recognize. Um, the take-home message is you need to know that this is stomach and these are gastric varices from portal hypertension from somebody who probably has liver cirrhosis. So I feel a little bit like I'm uh, beating a dead horse with this uh, slide. But here, hepatosplenomegaly with ascites and varices. Okay, we got another learning objective we got to hit. And that is, what about this kid riding the bicycle? So here we got this little munchkin, um, tricycle motor, curtain monkey, rug rat, um, whatever else you want to call him. Uh, riding along on his bicycle, he crashes, and then boom, the handlebars hit him in the belly, and lo and behold, he cracks his pancreas. So here's what it looks on CT scan. Here's what it looks like. So here's the common bile duct. Here's the pancreas right here. This is the splenic vein. Here's the aorta, and there's the crack. Right here's the crack in the pancreas. So here's another one. This is another kid. Crack the pancreas. And we got blood, free blood in here around the liver, floating around the liver. Here's blood floating around the kid's belly. And we have uh, stomach. This is probably the splenic artery because it's curlicued. I mean, I would be impressed if this little uh, five-year-old kid had uh, varices from drinking booze, unless he's a hard partier. Um, so we have this pancreatic transection. Now, 
what do I need to do as the surgeon? What am I going to do about this? Here's another one. Boom, right there. Pancreatic transection. What's the treatment? Well, the first thing is with little kids, if he's hemodynamically stable, I don't have to do anything. But if that major duct that runs through the pancreas, the major pancreatic duct of Worsung, if that duct is transected, then I'm going to have to go in and divide this pancreas and take out this segment and over sew that stump. Otherwise, if that duct leaks, it's going to leak bicarbonate, amylase, lipase, and it can form just a big giant mess of goo back here. And if you remember from chemistry, you'll get some saponification of your uh, tissues, uh, which can uh, lead to uh, just an inflammatory process back here. Now your enzymes, uh, amylase and lipase, really work best in an acidic environment. So as long as you don't have a hole in your stomach, these enzymes aren't going to be necessarily be active, but you will uh, get some saponification as a result of uh, the uh, bicarbonate, uh, which is released through the major duct amylase and lipase. So here's what it looks like on the little kid. You see the handlebar, and it's where the end of the handlebar poked him. And uh, he's got a little belly button hernia too. He doesn't know it. but <clears throat> And here you can see this red mark, probably where he hit the ground. So what relationship does the SMA have to the left renal vein, uh, retroperitoneal duodenum, what's nutcracker syndrome, what's SMA syndrome? We've talked about all these. But there's one thing that I want to hit on about that little kid uh, that got nailed with that bicycle. We need to do an ERCP, endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatogram. You remember this from BSF? We need to do an ERCP to make sure that that duct of Worsong, that major pancreatic duct, is intact. If it is not intact, then we're going to have to operate on him. If that major duct is intact and the kid's hemodynamically stable, we can sit and he'll get better with time. Kids are amazingly resilient. Uh, they also die really quick too. Uh, but you have to uh, give their body a chance to heal. So we're going to do an ERCP on that little kid. It'll give us more information than an MRCP will. Some of you may ask, why not just put him in the MR scanner? Uh, the resolution MR scanner is getting better all the time. So there might be a uh, need for that in the future. But for now, it would be an ERCP. So now let's look at what we uh, have learned about SMA syndrome. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. You've had this before. So what happens with SMA syndrome? Uh, usually... Uh, it, this is somebody who is exorbitantly skinny, someone who is emaciated from cancer, from um, bulimia or anorexia, someone who has been in a concentration camp. They have absolutely no body fat back here underneath the superior mesenteric artery or the superior mesenteric vein. All the body fat's gone. The weight of the artery pushes across the duodenum and it causes them to puke. Everything backs up. So here it is. Here is the uh, vertebral body. Here's the aorta. Here's the superior mesenteric vein. Here's the superior mesenteric artery. Here's the duodenum. Duodenum has all this fluid and it can't push it through because the duodenum, which is right here, is being compressed by the superior mesenteric artery. There's no body fat back here. And look, there's no body fat on this patient at all. Look here at the... Uh, Look here at the skin and the subcutaneous tissues. I mean, there's minimal body fat on this person. Same thing over here, minimal body fat. And, and we're looking at the same thing here. Here's the duodenum. Here is the uh, aorta. Here's the superior mesenteric artery. Here's superior mesenteric vein. And it can't push the fluid through. So now let's look at nutcracker syndrome. We've beat this like a dead horse in the past. This is when the weight of the superior mesenteric artery or congenitally, it's at a more steep angle, compresses on the left renal vein, causing some venous distension within the left kidney and some vague abdominal pain. And here we're looking at the vertebral body, aorta, cava, left renal vein, right here, left renal vein, and it's being pinched by the superior mesenteric artery. Now, this is probably a congenital condition uh, it's not, to my knowledge, related to um, emaciation, although that probably could contribute to it. I have never knowingly seen this, uh, and I've operated on people before and taken out gallbladders when they complained of right upper quadrant pain and left upper quadrant pain. 
Um, so it's possible someone may have had this and I missed it, but I have never knowingly seen this. So now let's talk about the uh, retroperitoneal lymph nodes. So the lymphatic drainage of the pancreas comes from lymph nodes all along the celiac axis here. There are nodes all over the superior aspect of the pancreas, the inferior pan uh, border of the pancreas. Um, so the lymphatic drainage is very large uh, and very good. But occasionally we run into somebody who ends up with giant, engorged, abnormally sized lymph nodes in the retroperitoneum. And this is a sign of somebody that can end up with what looks like lymphoma. So here's the aorta, and you have all of this mass, which is just a giant wad of lymph nodes encasing the aorta. All of this is lymphadenopathy, retroperitoneal lymphadenopathy. Uh, it'll cause some ischemia of the intestines. It'll cause intense pain because it involves the celiac plexus. Now let's look at a cross section. So let's get ourselves uh, uh, oriented. So here is the vertebral body. Here's the aorta. We recognize it because it has calcifications in it. And then look right underneath the aorta, right there. Lymph node, lymph node, lymph node. All of these giant lymph nodes, lymph node, lymph node. Here, here, here. So here's the aorta. Here's the vena cava. Here is the pancreas here. And you can see the pancreas is really knobby looking. And that's from lymphadenopathy all over the pancreas. Here's the duodenum. Here's the lumen of the duodenum, the wall of the duodenum, which is a little thick, actually. Uh, here's the wall of the duodenum with some contrast in it. And then we have all of this retroperitoneal lymphadenopathy, giant lymph nodes. This patient probably has, uh, probably has uh, um, cancer. And there's no telling what, what type. It could be lymphoma. Uh, it could be a metastatic cancer. It could be primary malignancy of the uh, pancreas. Not sure. We'd have to go in and biopsy this. <clears throat> so we know about the celiac axis, and I want you to be able to draw the branches of the celiac axis. So here it is. coming. It's the first major branch outside of the uh, aortic hiatus. So here is the abdominal aorta, and here we have the left gastric artery, the splenic artery, and what do we call this one? The common hepatic artery right here, common hepatic artery, gives rise to the uh, gastroduodenal artery right there. And then the gastroduodenal artery gives off an anterior and a posterior branch, and it's highlighted with little crosshatch marks right there. Gives off an anterior, superior, pancreatic duodenal artery. This would be the posterior superior pancreatic duodenal artery. And then if we were to move the pancreas out of the way, here we have the superior mesenteric artery and vein, and superior mesenteric artery is given off small branches to the inferior aspect of the pancre pancreatic head. And guess what we call those? There's a anterior inferior pancreatic duodenal uh, artery, and then there's a posterior inferior pancreatic duodenal artery. So the blood supply to the head of the pancreas is very good. Now, I mentioned Whipple procedure. If someone gets a cancer here, a Whipple procedure is where we remove the cancer uh, of the head of the pancreas by transecting the pancreas here right over the uh, portal vein and right over the superior mesenteric vein right here and we take out the duodenum we take out the bile ducts that come in to uh, drain into the duodenum it's a major operation and then we have to rewire you we have to rehook your plumbing up so that what's left of your pancreas and the pancreatic ductal system can drain so here we are again we took out that mid portion of the pancreas and here we can see the superior mesenteric vein superior mesenteric artery this is inferior mesenteric artery. This is the blood supply back from the large intestine. This is the blood supply back from the small intestine. So SMV, small intestine, and the inferior mesenteric vein is large intestine uh, blood return. And then here you can see the gastroepiploic artery and vein right here. This is from the stomach and 
because of all of its connections here through the spleen with the portal system, that's how we get those gastric varices. So some more pancreatic anatomy. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to uh, look at this on your own and start to uh, label this. That's really the purpose of what these uh, images I put in here for. So here's the C-loop of the duodenum, superior mesenteric arteries, I'm sorry, superior mesenteric arteries, superior mesenteric vein. Here we have celiac trunk, uh, left gastric, the splenic artery, common uh, hepatic. We have the body of the uh, pancreas. Large vessels come off and supply the tail of the pancreas. This is this branch right here is called the pancreatica magna, which means giant uh, artery of the pancreas, pancreatica magna. And of course, we have the gastroduodenal, and then we have anterior, superior, we have posterior, superior, and here we have the inferior and the uh, posterior inferior branches. So here we are on VH dissector. Let's or orient ourselves. Here's the vertebral body. Here's the spinal cord. There's a spine, uh, right kidney, left kidney. Here's the aorta, superior mesenteric artery right there. Here's the head of the pancreas in purple. What is right next to the aorta? Well, it's the vena cava. What's this guy going to be right there? That's probably the SMV. So let's keep uh, looking at some more anatomy. You need to know a definition of a portal system. I gave that to you a minute ago. It's veins that transport blood between two capillary beds. Or uh, as Wikipedia says, when a capillary bed pulls into another capillary bed of veins without first going through the heart. Um, so we're, we're kind of beating this one to death. I mentioned this to you in an earlier slide. So here's our portal system. We have the portal system. Uh, right here is a portal vein. It is not attached to the inferior vena cava. It looks like it is here, but it isn't. This is the portal vein right there. And the portal vein is made up of splenic vein, inferior mesenteric vein, superior mesenteric vein. Right there, portal vein. So describe and identify those structures of the pancreas to support its exocrine function. So now we're talking about the ductal system. So here we have the main pancreatic duct right here. We have a minor pancreatic duct. And all of this comes from embryology. We, if you recall from your embryology, the anterior and posterior portions of the pancreas form from an anterior bud and a posterior bud. They uh, wrap around the duodenum. And then most of the uh, part that wraps around the duodenum is absorbed and it leaves just the major pancreatic duct draining into the duodenum. But sometimes that uh, anterior and posterior bud they do not go away. And then we end up with the duodenum being encased in pancreas. So let's just look at the anatomy here. So we've got the major pancreatic duct of Worsung, the duct of Santorini. Here's the duct that if the kid uh, crushes with his bicycle, we're going to have to operate on him. Here's the superior mesenteric artery and vein coming out from below the uh, neck of the pancreas. Here is the retroperitoneal portion of the duodenum. And here's, the, here's an even better look. So here is where the common bile duct and the major pancreatic duct join. And if you get a gallstone right there, stuck right there, everything upstream gets pissed off. The liver can't drain, so the bile backs up and the patient comes in jaundiced and yellow. And then the enzymes from the pancreas back up, and then the pancreas gets pissed off uh, from all of the uh, enzymes trying to uh, be excreted by the pancreas. We call that gallstone induced pancreatitis gallstone pancreatitis so that's where that term comes from gallstone pancreatitis means uh, gallstone is or gallstones have been stuck in the common buck common bile duct and they're backing up so uh, <clears throat> just uh, another look at the uh, anatomy nice beautiful picture here from netter's atlas showing us basically the same thing that we've uh, been going through here so the tail, the pancreas, the body, the neck, superior mesenteric artery and vein, retroperitoneal duodenum. Um, and then here is the endocrine portion of the uh, duct itself. You guys have had this multiple times. You have the uh, uh, alpha cells, alpha islets, beta, uh, and <clears throat> delta cells. And what do they secrete? 
Um, what is the exocrine function of the pancreas? Amylase, lipase, um, bicarbonate to uh, neutralize the uh, stomach acid. And here, right there, here's where the uh, major duct, pancreatic duct, joins the common bile duct, and it's called the common channel theory. Common channel theory of the cause of gallstone pancreatitis. There are papers out there that say that gallstone pancreatitis is not caused by a stone that blocks off both ducts. In my experience, however, that has never been the case. Um, and there probably is some other pathophysiologic process that can cause it, but I don't know what it is. <clears throat> so what's annular pancreas? Well, we talked about the embryology of the pancreas coming from uh, the dorsal and the uh, um so we have a ventral pancreatic bud and a dorsal pancreatic bud. They wrap around the pancreas and right here. This usually absorbs. In some patients, it doesn't. And you get this ventral pancreas and a dorsal pancreas wrapping around the duodenum. We call that an annular pancreas. And here's what it looks like on CAT scan right here. So this is an even better image. So here's the head of the pancreas here, right there. Here's the duodenum which is totally encased in pancreas. It's around the entire duodenum. Over here, same thing. Here's the head of the pancreas, right here, head of the pancreas. This is a, a duodenum and it's completely encased. So this can cause a bowel obstruction, just like the superior mesenteric artery syndrome. Um, same thing, we have to go in and you would have to divide uh, this pancreas here and free it up free up the duodenum from being compressed by that uh, pancreas. Uh, I have never done one of those operations, and to my knowledge, when I was in my training and 20 years of practice, I never saw an annular pancreas get operated on. Uh, but it can happen, and here's the proof. Oh, uh, one other thing on that image. Uh, notice there's a little bit of hydronephrosis here in this uh, kidney, just a little bit of hydronephrosis. And here we have the renal vein coming over. So here is the aorta. Here is body of pancreas. Um, superior mesenteric artery is here. Superior mesenteric vein is here. So what's the pathognomonic uh, feature of the splenic artery? That looks like a little curly cue from a pig. That's splenic artery here, all these curly cues. And here it is on an MR, a three-dimensional reconstructed MR. So here's the spleen and here's the curly cue. And that's how you can recognize it. Splenic vein does not look like that. Okay. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit now, for just a second, we're almost done with uh, explain why a pancreatic in, uh, injury is often hard to find on your physical exam. Here's somebody who came in and they've got a cracked kidney and the kidney is bleeding in the retroperitoneum. And you see that there's some air here right around the retroperitoneum, right around, uh, if you remember, this would be perirenal fat. This is pararenal fat. Um, there's a little air, so this is bothersome. Uh, it makes me think that they may have poked a hole in their intestine or something too. It's leaking air. But here we've got all this blood in the retroperitoneum. So we have a retroperitoneal hematoma, lots of blood. Over here, blood too. And then you can see the pancreas is outlined right there. The retroperitoneal uh, membrane is uh, on that. Let's go back and look at that. The retroperitoneal membrane over the pancreas is also has some blood underneath it. Now, before we get going further, look at this. If blood can track out of these planes, and if some of this blood can get out of the plane and go up here and get absorbed through the peritoneum, we're going to see a bruise up here where, it, where the blood bruises the anterior abdomen. So the question... Using your understanding of anatomy, explain why a pancreatic energy, uh, injury is difficult to detect. Okay, pretty easy. Um, it's hard to detect because it's retroperitoneal. When you push down up here and say, hey, does your tummy hurt? Does your belly hurt? Well, you're not poking back here where it does hurt, where that cracked kidney is. He, can't, he feels that. He's going to have flank pain. He's going to have blood in his urine. Um, he might even be hypotensive from losing blood, but he's not going to be able to feel it up here because it's all in the retroperitoneum. So it looks like this, Cullen sign. This is a guy that's got hemorrhagic pancreatitis. So you get blood right near the midline, 
right here near the linea alba. He also has a belly button hernia right there. He's got a little hernia. Um, and he has this collection of blood that is tracked between the transfer salus fascia and the subcutaneous fat. And I'll show you that here in a minute. So Cullen sign, superficial edema and bruising in the subcutaneous fat around the belly button from blood that has leaked from the retroperitoneum. And if it's on the flank, over here on the flank, we call that Gray Turner's sign. So here's Cullen's, here's Gray Turner's. Right here, this is Gray Turner's. Guy's got bleeding somewhere in the retroperitoneum. Why does it happen? Well, here's the peritoneum. Here's the linea alba. Okay, so here's the midline of the abdomen right here. Here's the midline of the abdomen. Here's peritoneum. Well, if we follow that peritoneum around, blood is going to get in from the retroperitoneum, which is going to be in this fascial plane here, or above this fascial plane is what I should say. So as we follow it up around the belly, it's going to be right here, and it's going to stain these tissues red. As some of that blood gets absorbed through the fascia, you're going to see it right here. So the blood's going to uh, collect above the transfer salus fascia. So here's the belly, midline, linea alba. Here's your rectus muscle. Okay. So if somebody punches you in the belly in the rectus muscle, you might get blood here and get a, uh, a colon sign too. But if it's bleeding from the retroperitoneum, this is the area right above the transfer salus fascia, which is above that uh, bleeding point. So now let's take another look. So here, this patient's got free air. He's got a hole in something. He's going to go to the operating room. But this air can track just right here. It's starting to go. It's going to go up into the transfer salus fascia. Now, this patient's pretty fat. There's a lot of body fat here. So they may not. Uh, show us a, gr a gray turner's or colon sign same thing here we have air this so here is uh, uh, the vertebral body we have aorta we have cava this is probably pancreas here i think they put a d to try to show me it's duodenum uh, this is probably pancreas blood hazy all over everything's inflamed and irritated there's air in here something has perforated and it's going to track up through this line right there where the transfer salus fascia is comes under that rectus muscle so here's a rectus muscle it's going to come right in there and that's where it's going to stain and give us the colon sign and if it's in the flank over here it's going to stain through and it's going to give us a, a gray turner sign hope that makes sense anyways uh that's it uh there's a lot of information here thanks for hanging with me if you got any questions email me Please make sure that you watch those videos uh, that I posted on YouTube. Uh, it'll make uh, understanding all this a lot easier. Send me your comments. Thanks.